This is the lecture for European history for Wednesday, the 17th of February, 2021. Um, people should have their notes out. And where we were is we had concluded with the unification of Germany with uh, Bismarck bringing socialism to Germany in order to forestall uh, a lot of the arguments of the communists and other uh, socialist type revolutionaries. Um, and also how after basically 30 years, more than 30 years in the driver's seat, um, after the old king Wilhelm dies and the Emperor Friedrich uh, lives very, very short period of time as emperor, Wilhelm II, this young, brash guy with a withered arm and masculine overcompensation, um, fires this. Bismarck threatens to resign. Bismarck says, sorry to see you go. Uh, Wilhelm says, sorry to see you go. And the reason for that is that Wilhelm did not want to share power. Wilhelm, the young man, wanted to be emperor, and he wanted to do a bunch of things that he knew that stodgy old Bismarck wouldn't want, like build an empire, like build a navy, like build another, a number of things that Germany, according to Bismarck, didn't need. And uh, Bismarck made it right. So now we are shifting from the age of... Uh, uh, nation building, nationalism, national unification, to the final phase of Unit 3, which is the age of European empire building. Now, in colleges, you will hear a bunch of modern, with it, professors of history, if you even have to take history, who are absolutely dedicated to flailing themselves, and you, and us, for being Western. Because the West is the most evil civilization ever, because we conquered the world back in the late 1800s. Well, we did. We being our Western civilization. Why? Because the West industrializes. No one else had. That creates such a power imbalance, it's as great as Cortez versus the Aztecs. Arguably, it's greater. You, in the Cortez versus the Aztecs, have technology that is about 2,000 years more advanced in the hands of the Spaniards. They've got horses, they've got steel body armor, they've got guns, including hand weapons and artillery pieces. They've got ships, um, eventually more ships come. Uh, they have battle tactics and techniques that are far in advance of what the Aztecs had to develop in order to conquer much of Mexico. And as a result, with some native help, Cortez and a few hundred Spaniards conquered an empire of millions. Well, in the case of industrial era Europe, you have a similar type of technology advantage. First of all, the population pressures in Europe are growing because more people are living. It seems paradoxical that population would increase during such filthy pollution as existed in the early Industrial Revolution, where coal smoke is everywhere, where people are living in hypercrowded conditions, where there is not sufficient bathing, where people are just figuring out that if you have your sewers run into where you get your drinking water, there might be cholera problems. <clears throat> it takes time. London eventually figures this out. And their problem with uh, rampant diseases really, really declines. But it, it wasn't until the 1800s, the mid-1800s, when this actually happens. So again and again, the old pre-industrial ways are augmented by industrialism. And industrialism shows a way to improve quality of life for much of the population. In fact, everyone benefits in some way, shape, or form in the long run from the Industrial Revolution, who's a part of it. Even the workers live longer lives, eat a better diet, 
have a more steady diet. Um, more of their children live to adulthood. The European family is the first uh, culture on earth to undergo the industrial contraction. When there's an industrial revolution in Europe, Europe starts out with the similar pre-industrial birth patterns of have kids, have kids, have all sorts of kids, because many of them won't live through their pregnancy or through the infancy or through their childhood or through their teenage years. And when you get old, you need your kids to take care of you. Who else will? So people had lots of kids. But as the industrial era develops, the size of European families declines. The number of children radically decreases. Thinking of this in biological terms, there are some species that try to survive by having massive numbers of uh, reproduction. Uh, they, they lay massive numbers of eggs. It's very easy to fertilize, like fish. Um, you saw Finding Nemo, presumably, old Disney movie. Um, and you saw how many eggs there were before the predator, spoiler alert, sad moment, before the predator comes at the beginning of the movie. Uh, and there's only one left. Well, that's the way a lot of species reproduce. They just mass, mass, mass. Human beings, to an extent, did that too, because so many died. But with more children living and with resources becoming both easier to get, but more of an effort to get, you need more training to succeed in life. What Europeans did is they changed strategies. Instead of having lots of kids that you give a little attention to, Europeans began to have many smaller families, but each child gets more attention, more of an education, more of a preparation. Uh, more of the adult's time and energy is gone into helping make sure these kids are raised right. And so that happens. It still hasn't happened in places in the third world today. And if you wonder why we have a population problem on the earth, a Mal you know, what potentially Malthusian one, although thus far our ability to innovate has outpaced our population, that, that may or may not continue. Um, the problem is not in Europe, it's not in the developed world, it's not in Australia or New Zealand, it's not in the United States or Canada, um, it's not even in Russia. The problem is in Africa, Latin America, uh, and tropical Asia, where you have pre-industrial birth patterns retained where your status is determined by how many children you have. And where it's expected that if you don't have a lot of children, you may not be much of a man or you may not be much of a woman. This hasn't changed. These regions uh, since World War II have been gifted with technology they never developed, including medicine that they couldn't have developed, not with their level of technology, but we have given it to them. And the result is massive, massive overpopulation in these countries. One of the reasons why so many third world countries are in crisis is because they have half of their population under the age of 18. I'll say that again. Half of their population is under the age of 18. What that means is if you have a family with a dozen kids back in 1945, before this really hits the third world, maybe half of them will live to adulthood to have children of their own. So having lots of kids makes sense up to then. But since then, every generation, and you can count a generation as 20 years, um, 12 children, of which 10 or 11 have children, of which 10 or 11 have children, of which 10 or 11 have children, and so on. So we go from a population, um, a global population, our population uh, worldwide has doubled in my lifetime. That's significant. And it's because, in part, of the legacy of European imperialism. So it's a complex legacy. It is not purely a negative legacy. 
Uh, and the jury is still out on, on, on what has, what, what it really means for the rest of the world. We'll talk about this stuff in detail. We'll start by talking about the Victorian era, which is the mid to late 19th century, named after Britain's Queen Victoria, who becomes queen, I, I think at age 17 in 1837, and uh, she lives until she's a very old lady in 1901. The only British monarch that's ever outlived her is the current Queen Elizabeth II. Now, in the Victorian era, the stereotype that most people have about it is similar to the stereotype that people have about the pilgrims, that they're sexually repressed, uh, that they are um, moralists, and that they never have any fun. And as with the pilgrims, this is not entirely true. First of all, human beings take pleasure from the sexual act. Some cultures are more open to it than others. The pilgrims were fine with pleasure, as long as you were in a married relationship. The Victorians are the same way. So when you hear about people talking about Victorian morality, if they're not historians, for the most part, they're talking about very straight-laced ideas about preserving your virtue until you're married, especially if you're a woman, uh, about not sleeping around, certainly not having children out of wedlock. And you can decide if our society, where we let it all hang out, is better for children than the Victorian society that actually put pressure on people to try to have children within the bonds of matrimony, where you have a father and a mother both involved in the raising of the child. The truth is, both have their strengths and weaknesses. But there is something that comes from being the first industrialized society that is a problem, certainly from a modern standpoint, for Europeans. You remember Jefferson's original words in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident. And that is a statement about 18th century Enlightenment approaches to natural law. We look at nature, we look at uh, the natural laws that operate around us, and we try to, do, to, to deduce what those laws are and what they mean for us. Well, Europeans looked around. We're the only society that has industrialized. We're the only society that has factories. We're the only society that um, has emancipated our slaves. That's a big deal. Before you have industry, you need muscle power. Once you have industry, you no longer need massive amounts of muscle power. It is not an accident that Britain, the first industrializing country, becomes the great anti-slavery crusader. Nor is it an accident that the Union part of the United States of America, the North, in the Civil War, wanted nothing to do with slavery but on moral grounds, but also because the North had industrialized. The South had not. The North didn't need slaves. In fact, slavery would interfere with the natural ebb and flow of, of economics, where you, you know, you're you seeking your, your best interests. Uh, the South needed slaves to grow the cotton for those very factories in the North and in Britain that so eschewed slavery. Well, they benefited from it. Just as a lot of modern Americans who spout off about human rights benefit from the cheap fruit and vegetable prices that come from using migrant labor from Latin America in harvest season. We benefit from the very exploitation that so many of us, so many of us decry. But what comes out of this is a sense that Europeans, because we have advanced, because we have a scientific understanding, because we see diseases as the problem that brings illness and not demons as the problem that brings illness, because we treat our women well and compared to Africans in general or Asians in general or other pre-industrial societies in general, in the developed, most developed areas of Europe in particular, 
you have a growing uh, establishment of women who are the wives of the wealthy and the powerful or the wives of the middle class who become a very powerful force within society for charity, for social reform, uh, establishing soup kitchens, orphanages, schools for the poor, uh, establishing anti-child labor laws. And ultimately, these women are rewarded for their civic involvement with the vote. These things don't happen in Asia or Africa. Um, in Africa, not only does the African lion, who is a male, basically defend the, the pride against other male lions, uh, but not hunt, that's left to the females. In Africa, the men hunt and they wage war in traditional sub-Saharan Africa, but the women do the farm work. So the women are at work in the fields and the women are at work with their children while the men are sitting by their fire uh, drinking beer. The roles of men and women in Europe move towards a more modern egalitarian model. And one of the things Europeans look at when they look at the countries of the tropics in particular, they see benighted primitives who view human life as disposable. They also see superstitious primitives, and they see primitives who possess land that they have no first, they have a clue how to, uh, how to, uh, how to develop. Now that's typical of the attitude within the United States towards the American Indians, and in Canada towards the American Indians. And I, I will say this, learn about it yourself if you doubt me. The American record, as bad as it can be, uh, as bad as it is at times with the American Indians, is still better than the Canadian record, at least during the 19th century. Which is saying something. The only time the United States ever engaged in germ warfare was against American Indians under the Jackson administration. Somebody had the brilliant idea of taking woolen blankets from cholera wards in the eastern hospitals and shipping them west to Indian trading posts and selling them for practically nothing, just giving them away. Um, and the blankets carried disease to people who had no immunity to it. And it was intended to thin out the Indian population, and it did. If I have to look at the darkest, if I have to choose the darkest moment in American history, that's what I choose. Even worse than slavery, I think that is. Because that is a willful genocide. It was not perpetrated by all Americans. It was not something Jackson talked a lot about, but it was something that his administration did. You know one of the nicest countries in Europe? Belgium. They have endives, waffles, and chocolate. But the Belgians under King Leopold in the late 19th and early 20th centuries are actually the bloodiest uh, conquerors in Africa by far. They're completely brutal. So one of the things that lends European imperialism in the Victorian era a particular flavor is that Europeans believe in two things which are dangerous. First is that they have been blessed by God to lead the world. It's self-evident. If we hadn't been blessed by God to lead the world, why on earth would we be the only ones with factories? So, of course, God intended us to lift up the benighted peoples. So there's a sense of destiny there. There's a sense of almost mission and messianicness of Europe saving the world from itself. And at the same time, there is this sense of absolute morality that right is right is right and wrong is wrong is wrong. Not many shades of gray. There's black and there's white. That's it. And there is a moral clarity that comes from this absolutist belief, which is something our society profoundly lacks. 
we doubt, we remonstrate, we rip out our own guts as we wonder, is this really good? Is this really bad? Is this a, a shade of gray? And all too often, we in our modern society give ourselves a pass and just assume, you know, life's a shade of gray. Why even try to be good? Why try to worry about it? Just do what you got to do. In the name of pragmatism, annihilate the very concept of morality, which you can decide how dangerous that actually might be in the atomic age or in the age where we've mapped the human genome. In Victorian times, there was a strong sense that Judeo-Christian morality was true, here, there, and everywhere, for all people. So when Britain goes to India and it finds a caste system, which still exists, by the way, that is uh, happy to treat people in the lower castes like they have dirty souls and therefore they deserve to suffer, particularly the untouchables, uh, the British try intervening because it seems unchristian and cruel. In India, one of the Hindu cults is the cult of Kali, a female goddess with many arms who wears a necklace of male members around her neck. She is a goddess of chaos and death, and serving her is the cult of the Thuggee. It's a murder cult. <laughs> One of the things the Thuggee do is they'll walk through a city at sunset, and the last person who meets their eyes before the setting of the sun is then stalked and tracked and murdered in the name of Kali, in the name of death and of chaos. The thuggy will use knives and they'll use their bare hands, but they're famous for using what is called the thuggy knot. You take a piece of string or rope and the thuggy knot creates this big, ugly ball uh, that is the knot. And if you know what you're doing, what you do is you bring the knot around somebody's throat by dropping it over their head for stealth and you snap it and hold back the thuggy knot crushes their windpipe, and by holding back after you've crushed their windpipe, they die silently. Um, British commandos used to do this to the Germans in World War II. They learned it from the thuggy. The British fight incredibly long wars against the thuggy cult. They actually had lose battles to the thuggy for a while. But they fought them because the thuggy cult offended the British sense of morality. Is that cult still, like, around? Supposedly, no. Yeah. <laughs> Supposedly, no. I mean, if you want to see one of the more ridiculous depictions of it, see the second Indiana Jones movie. They do a terrible <laughs> job there. In that, they have the power to rip a person's heart out of their <laughs> chest with tele telekinesis. But, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure, like most dark cults, there are remnants in the okay. world. Yeah. But they no longer overtly control territory like they used to. Yeah. They used to actually have castles in the mountains, and the British destroyed all of them. And the British were very clear, if we find Thuggy anywhere, we will hunt them down and kill them. Yeah. Uh, because they were just so odious. Another, t another custom that the British um, stopped because they thought it was immoral was the sate. The sate is where a Hindu woman who's devoted to her husband throws herself on his funeral pyre at his funeral. Now, the Vikings had a version of this, too. Um, when a great man dies, uh, if he has uh, a woman, a wife, or a, a mistress, um, or a slave, it has to be a woman, well thought of. She can choose to uh, gain honor by dying in the burning ship of the Viking chieftain. In India, it's a similar sort of thing. Uh, the body is consumed in cremation. And the wife is supposed to throw herself on the burning fire as a final act of devotion to her husband. The British put a stop to this to the extent they possibly could because they thought it was inhuman. So the absolute morality of the Victorian era and of European imperialism had its good points and its bad points. But on the good side, it stopped women from suiciding when their husbands died before them, and it stopped 
uh, a murder cult. Um, and there were a number of other ameliorations that happened. But it still creates a sense of superiority and almost smugness, which is very unattractive and very unappealing, and also is uh, the sort of thing that really sets people off today. The historian, uh, Barbara Tuckman, great popular historian of the mid to late 20th century, wrote a book about this period, about the late 18 and early 1900s, calling it the Proud Tower. And what that's a reference to is to the Tower of Babel in the Old Testament uh, book of Genesis. In the story of the Tower of Babel, men from around the world deem it wise to build a tower so high in the sky they can look God in the face. God found this idea offensive, so he confusticated the languages. Uh, suddenly people who had been working together, speaking a common language, didn't understand one another. They, they were suddenly speaking in Babel to one another, and the project fizzled and died. Um, the Proud Tower is a reference to a sense of moral superiority that is almost hubris. And if you remember your Greek mythology, you know what hubris invites. Hubris invites nemesis. Hubris invites doom. So in the Victorian morality of the time, uh, British people, particularly British liberals, and there were plenty, saw themselves as the great social reformers, not only in Britain, but of the world itself. And as a result, they had no patience for savage superstitions. Now, Charles Dickens' work, which we've already talked about, pointing out the problems in society, inspires Britons to reform their own society, to get rid of child labor laws, to try to clean up uh, London, to try to deal with uh, the starving on the streets, to try to make prisons more humane, to try to point out how hypocrisy uh, can lead to people who seem totally fine on the surface acting in odious fashion behind the scenes. It's strange because I think that we can still see that kind of, not necessarily, I mean, hubris in some ways, but with people with certain, like, people who are very, um, like, they believe very strongly in their faith or something like that, mm -hmm. or um, things like that, and they want to try and, like, um, convert others. And yeah. I think that uh, sometimes you can see still that, almost like that Absolutely. Um, because this Victorian attitude reflects a basic part of human nature. We like to be right. We also, we also like to be needed. And if the world is filled with people who are misguided, and if we have an answer that they need, and we really believe that, we can become both very useful, very generous, and also very, very obnoxious, very blind to our own hypocrisy. And that is a downside. And I've seen people of all belief systems have that. It's, it's often called chauvinism. Now, the word chauvinism in our society tends to be used for male chauvinism against women, looking down at women's capabilities of doing this or that. But chauvinism as a word means an unreflected upon sense of superiority. And that unreflected sense of superior, uh, upon sense of superiority can come in the form of missionaries who are trying to convert you from demon worship to the true faith. It can come in the form of social reformers that look at working class families and say, you guys are idiots. You're, you're, you're sending your children into the factories and the mines. Don't you love your children? Whereas the working class people are saying, don't you understand that we need every penny to avoid starvation? That these kids are expensive and the only way they make sense, the only way we can support them is if they help pay for themselves? Look, today, how many people have a compassion for people of other races? And they look at history and they see it as a story of one race oppressing another race. 
And with the best of motives, they then prescribe a bunch of solutions for people of that other race. Assuming that people of that other race can't come up with their own solutions. Assuming that people of that other race need them. The presumption of superiority is epic in a case like that. But it's still chauvinism. Because it lacks humility. It lacks any sense of awareness that you may have a better idea. But don't treat adults like children. Don't treat people who have a disadvantage relative to you as a bunch of benighted, primitive children, savages who need enlightenment. Because if you do that, you again, you're engaged in a variant of hubris. The Victorians had that. But they also had good intentions. Please flip ahead to um, the first of the poems, which is after the Bell Epoch. The White Man's Burden by Kipling. Oh, God! Do people whip themselves about this one in college and in high school? Uh, this is seen as an example of white supremacy and of all that is wrong with the Age of Empires. But is that what it is? Read it with me and think about what Kipling is actually saying. Here's the context. In 1898, Spain and the United States fight the Spanish-American War. And part of that war is over the Philippine Islands off the coast of Asia. We make an alliance with Emilio Aguinaldo, leader of the Filipino resistance, to fight the Spaniards. Aguinaldo is told by us that we will then step back and let Philippines be independent. After all, it's a, it's a Catholic country. It's a country that for three, four hundred years has been under Spanish rule. It's an Asian country with many European characteristics. However, after the war, the Germans send a much more powerful battle squadron than we have in East Asia into Manila Bay. Loaded troop ships are with them. The Germans are waiting for us to honor our word to Aguinaldo. Once we leave, the Germans will march in. Aguinaldo will then have to fight the Germans. And the Germans are, in 1899, 1900, much more powerful than the Spaniards were and more powerful than we are. So Kipling, along with many Americans, are debating the wisdom of honoring our word to Emilio Aguinaldo. If we leave, the Germans will march in, and they will take the Philippines. There's no question. So what do we do? If we break our word, we keep the Germans out. Why would we want to take the Philippines? And Kipling, the great poet of the British Empire, uh, is, 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 is going to try to offer explanations as to why. So this is from 1899. Take up the white man's burden. Send forth the best you breed. Go bind your sons to exile to serve your captives' need. To wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild, your new caught sullen peoples, half devil and half child. Take up the white man's burden and patience to abide, to veil the threat of terror and check the show of pride. By open speech and simple, and hundred times made plain to seek another's profit and work another's gain. Take up the white man's burden, the savage wars of peace. Fill full the mouth of famine and bid the sickness cease. And when your goal is nearest, the end for others sought, watch sloth and heathen folly bring all your hopes to naught. Take up the white man's burden, no iron rule of kings, but the toil of surf and sweeper, the tale of common things. The ports you shall not enter, the roads you shall not tread. Go make them with your living and mark them with your dead. Take up the white man's burden and reap his old reward. The blame of those you better, the hate of those you guard. The cry of host you humor, ah, slowly towards the light. Why brought ye us from bondage? I loved Egyptian night. Take up the white man's burden, you dare not stoop to less, nor call too loud on freedom to cloak your weariness. By all you will or whisper, by all you leave or do, the silent, sullen peoples shall weigh your God and you. 
take up the white man's burden, have done with childish days, the lightly proffered laurel, the easy, ungrudged praise. Comes now to search your manhood through all the thankless years, cold edged with dear bought wisdom, the judgment of your peers. The concept of noblesse of liege, which is a French term for what Spider-Man would say as with great power comes great responsibility, is redolent through Kipling's poem. We are the only civilized people on the earth. The Filipinos may have Spanish Christianity, but they don't have modernity. They still drink foul water. They still don't have modern medicine. They still treat their women like slaves. They still have variants of slaves. You have a better way. A way with clean water, a way with better agriculture, a way that is modern, a way that is not steeped in superstition. How dare you? Sorry, Greta Thunberg. How dare you? How dare you? Um, Hold that back when you can make life better for other people. What Kipling is saying, and whether you see this as purely self-serving hypocrisy or not, what Kipling is saying is that as you have been given great things, a wealthy country, freedom, advanced technology, a people with the courage to go out and do great things, you should use that to better the world. This is a social progress mission. Take the Philippines. Don't let the Germans have it. The Germans will only exploit it. They'll only use the people of the Philippines. Take the people of the Philippines under your wing. Teach them civilized ways. And in a few generations, they will join you as partners. But if you fail, I will call it, if you fail to do it, if you fail to take up this burden, what are you? What do you stand for, really, other than sloth and self-interest? Yes. I do see that, but I also think that, in a way, it's like he's, uh, it's always going to be his idea of better, because it's not necessarily, it's um, society as a whole, he's thinking their society, obviously, is the best, is better, mm -hmm. and in some ways it probably was because of the advancements and everything else. Mm -hmm. But it's still making that assumption saying, you know, we can't let the Germans, and I think that a lot of that pride is also seen in that because it's saying, like, why would we let the Germans take something that we could better in our own way, technically? But. Well, the Germans at that point were fairly rapacious. That, 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 that's something you'll learn. But you're absolutely right from a modern relativistic standpoint. Mm -hmm. We, since World War I, are a society more and more steeped in moral relativism. Moral relativism is the notion that there is no good or evil except saying it. There is no right or wrong except believing it. Therefore, somebody who is living in a mud hut somewhere in the jungle has an idea of right or wrong that's based in a culture that is New Stone Age or Old Stone Age. And that there is no intrinsic difference between that savage's belief system or that indigenous person's belief system, to use the modern terminology, and us, the possessors of 21st century society, technology, and so forth. From a modern standpoint, what you just said makes total sense. What I'm trying to illustrate, and your question makes it easier to do that, and I, by the way, this is not right or wrong, I'm expressing their ideas, is Victorians did not have morally relativistic assumptions. They had morally absolute assumptions. They absolutely took for granted that their society was superior. Why? It had Christ. Why? It had industry. Why? It had medicine. Why? It had social reform. We would not have been given those gifts by a just and righteous God if he didn't want us to use them to make the rest of the world a better place. But it is always going to be in those terms. You're absolutely right. The point I'm trying to make isn't that Kipling was right, although I will freely admit I admire the dedication of that. <clears throat> the point I'm trying to make is to show you why good people and wise people would engage in conquering the world. World conquest was not simply a matter of uh, glory or gold. There was this modern rendition of social reform as, as serving God, 
which was very much a part of it, especially for the British and late latter day the Americans. The Germans were much more comfortable me saying, you know, me civilized, you savage, shut up and do what we say or we'll shoot you. The Belgians were far worse. Um, but it's just important that you understand that even though we're only talking about a, you know, a short time ago, 120 years, 130 years, it's a different world. It's a very different way of looking at the world. And again, what kicks this out of us is the First World War. Now, add to this uh, the Darwinian assumption that, that human nations are different species engaged in an evolutionary struggle for survival. And it's odd, because at the same time that you have this sort of righteousness, the self-righteousness that says that we've got to go up and take up the white man's burden and civilize the savage peoples of the world, at the very same moment, you've got other people saying, Christian morality shouldn't hold us back. You know, we're facing the Germans across the borders of Europe. We're facing the Russians in India. We're facing uh, the dissolution of the Chinese Empire. What are we going to do there? And... Because of the idea that social Darwinism is real, that Darwin is not only right about the development of our physical species as the human race, but he's also right about the way the world works, we have an intensification of the amoral savagery that's going to be so, so, so prevalent in the 20th century. The amoral savagery that leads us to the First World War, to a mass slaughter like we've never seen before or since, in some respects. To communism, which views human beings as, as raw materials. To fascism and Nazism. Uh, and, and all the various other totalitarianisms that look at us and don't see children of God worthy of dignity, but instead see slaves or human resources to be exploited to build utopia, because utopia is far more important than people. How many people does it take to get to utopia? It doesn't matter. You just grind and grind and grind until you get there. So at the same time that the moral sensibilities of the uh, Western world are being stimulated by people like Kipling, they're being eroded by this idea of social Darwinism, which leads to a variant of nihilism, which you can see here in the poem The Modern Traveler uh, by Hilaire Beloche which you should read with me. It's on the same page that the white man's group ends, lower right. Blood, who's a person? Blood thought he knew the native mind. He said, you must be firm, but kind. A mutiny resulted. I shall never forget the way that blood stood upon that awful day, preserved us all from death. He stood upon a little mound, cast his lethargic eyes around, and said beneath his breath, Whatever happens, we have got the Maxim gun, and they have not. And the Maxim gun is a machine gun. Picture native tribes, but that's it. That's all they need. Whatever happens, we have got the Maxim gun, and they have not. The native tribes uh, have their spears, and they have their bravery, and all we do is back and forth, back and forth, in like an infinity pattern, and um, they die until they stop coming, and then we take over. That is the rule of force. That is a pre-Christian primitivism that has re-entered Western civilization through the doorway of science. In the name of science, people are viewing morality as an outmoded thing that gets in the way of our fight for survival. Because in a Darwinian fight for survival, there is no mercy, there is no quarter, there is no sense of compassion. There is only kill or be killed, survive to breed or die out, adapt or perish. And it is that pre-Christian pseudo-scientific brutality that is going to really be the difference between the Victorian people with all of their quaint notions and the post-World War I 20th century, with its over-worship of force and power. There's another way the Europeans looked upon the East, 
and it's in the poem in the middle of the Moonline Pagoda, or Mandalay, also by Kipling. Uh, let's see, it's one paragraph, uh, or stanza. I just got to find it. It's near the end. Ah, it's the very last uh, two stanzas. So uh, you'll see right above the modern traveler, you'll hear, you'll see, ship me somewhere east of Suez. Remember, Suez is the canal that France built and British Britain took over through the Egyptian area between mainland mainstream Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula that allows you to travel by sea from the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea. Uh, this is in the words of Victorian soldiers resting in the shade of, a, of the Moonline Pagoda, looking out at the sea. Ship me somewhere east of Suez, where the best is like the worst, where there ain't no Ten Commandments, and a man can raise a thirst. For the temple bells are calling, and it's there that I would be, by the old Moonline Pagoda, looking lazy at the sea on the road to Mandalay, where the old flotilla lay, with our sick beneath the awnings when we went to Mandalay, on the road to Mandalay, where the flying fishies play, and the dawn comes up like thunder out of China across the bay. Ship me somewhere east of Suez, where the best is like the worst, where there ain't no Ten Commandments, and a man can raise the thirst. The Moonline Pagoda was like many temples in pre-Christian or non-Christian societies that are basically bordellos. So this pagoda is a place where the men can find women and where the sick can find healing and in any case the soldiers can find rest. Send me some of somewhere east of Suez. In this straight-laced Victorian European society, if a man wanted to live a life of wine, women, and song, he could do a lot worse than joining a colonial militia somewhere. Fighting natives, drinking and whoring and relaxing and not worrying because the natives don't have any sense of the value of human life. This is the antithesis, by the way, of the white man's birth. And Kipling, who is a wise fellow, expresses both. He understands, because he grew up in India, that a lot of people who serve in the colonial militias, uh, yes, nose please, uh, that a lot of people who serve in the colonial militias do in fact uh, have no concept of the white man's birth. They have a concept of what's fun now. And if you can't uh, shoot it or, or roll dice about it or drive it, that's a sort of a modern redneck thing, or make love to it, it doesn't really count in their mind as anything important. So this is the dark seedy side of empire. Social Darwinism does no favors to anyone. You really end up with a Nietzschean world. Now Friedrich Nietzsche is uh, one of the great philosophers of the late 19th century. Given his name, you might guess he's German. Nietzsche starts out as a great admirer of Richard Wagner, the glorious operas of the reigns of the Evil But Nietzsche ends up in an insane asylum. Between those moments, he serves as a medic in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-1871, and sees the horrors of war, and ends up developing a philosophy that posits a few pretty shocking things. First, Gott ist tot, God is dead. My wife used to have a poster on her college dorm room when we first met. God is dead, Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche is dead, God. Uh, Nietzsche also famously said, that which does not kill us makes us stronger. Uh, and that notion was that struggle produces strength. Adversity produces character. And he's, he's got a point. But there's also the quote on her door, uh, that which does not kill us makes us stronger, Friedrich Nietzsche. That which kills us makes us dead, Conan the Barbarian. She had a sense of humor, at least that appealed to me. In any event, uh, Nietzsche's notion is that we live in a world of force where there is no overriding morality, where the idea of a god that makes things just is outmoded and, and quaint and foolish. 
but that inside of each of us, listen close, is a Superman waiting to come out. An Ubermensch, a Superman. If only their willpower is unshackled from the simpering morality of Christ. If only the willpower is unshackled from the whinging of moralists. If only people will seize their power inside and do whatever is necessary to actualize the Superman within. So there is a brutality to Nietzsche's ideas, a ruthlessness to them, and a sense that the real challenge in society is not just to try to do what is right, but to do what is necessary to overcome our limitations, to unleash the potential inside of us, to free the Superman within. And again, what you see here is how morality twists and turns. Next time, we'll talk about the British Empire in particular. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.